Hello and welcome to the AIM Summit webinar on the shifting dynamics in corporate Japan. I'm your host, Zachary Seferati, the CEO and founder at Dama Capital and strategic partner of AIM Summit. We have attendees joining us from over 30 different countries. Amongst you are institutional investors, family offices, high net worth individuals, and leaders of the financial services industry. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. There is a Q&A dialogue at the bottom of your screen if you're dialing into us live on the Zoom platform. Um, again, ask your questions as they come. We will address them towards the end of the session. If you're joining us on YouTube after the fact, sorry you weren't able to participate in the Q&A, please sign up at aimsummit.com next time so you can be part of the live session. Um, but uh, if you're on YouTube, do take this opportunity to like, and like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel now. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the strategy behind Warren Buffett's recent Japanese equity purchases, uh, Suga's new administration and the push for digitalization, um, the COVID-19 response and the acceleration of the change of change in Japan and the continuing pace of consolidation in Japan uh, with parent child subsidiaries. I'm very happy to be introducing our sponsors and partners for the webinar today, which is Symphony Financial Partners. With its longstanding team of experienced professionals, Symphony leads investors to superior strategies to capitalize on opportunities in the Japanese equity markets. Symphony has developed a focused and repeatable process that benefits their investors and shareholders. Symphony has an unrivaled reputation for effectively engaging with its portfolio companies to improve corporate governance and create stronger companies. I'm also so pleased to be introducing our moderator today, uh, AIM Summit alumnus and one of our favorite uh, resources uh, and definitely my favorite journalist, uh, that's Henny Sender. Henny Sender is the chief correspondent at the Financial Times in Hong Kong. She was previously the Wall Street Journal's senior special writer for money and investing section and covered private equity and hedge funds. Before joining the journal, uh, Henny worked in Hong Kong for nearly 10 years and covered regional finance for the Wall Street Journal Asia and Far Eastern Economic Review. Henny holds an MS from Columbia University School of Journalism. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Re Relations and is, uh, if you don't already read her, her column religiously like I do, you should definitely start now. I'm also pleased to be introducing our two resources today who are gonna be giving us the insights into what is happening in, in Japan and uh, that is John Trammell and Alicia Ogawa. John Trammell is the Managing Director of Global uh, Strategic Initiatives at Symphony Financial Partners. He's the President of New York Episco Episcopalian Diocesan uh, Investment Trust um, and the trustee of the Diocesan Board uh, and a member of the Investment Committee and Advisory Board at Tiedemann uh, Investment Group. Um, and holds several other positions as a as a investment committee at leading prestigious institutions. He was the former cap, a former advisor to Blueprint Capital Partners and the former managing director at Solovis and management committee member at Novus Partners. And prior to joining the fintech industry, uh, John was the global co-head of asset management at Cantor Fitzgerald and CEO of Cordigan uh, Cordigan Management. Also, Alicia Ogawa, uh, she'll, she'll be joining us and giving us more insights into Japan, giving her long track record and expertise. She's the director of the project on Japanese corporate governance and stewardship at Columbia, Columbia Business School's Center on Japanese Economy and Business and an adjunct professor at Columbia, Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Since 2008, she has been the consultant to one of the largest US-based activist funds. She is currently a member of the board of directors of Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation and of Pure Earth. Ogawa is non-executive director at Tokyo-based Misaki Capital Funds, as well as Nippon Active Value Fund. She is a member of the International Corporate Governance Network, and she graduated from Bernard College and earned a master's degree in international affairs at SIPA. Uh, again, such a pleasure to have such an esteemed panel with us today. I'm going to hand over to Henny, who will be leading the fireside chat through this session. Henny. Thank you so much Thank for having so me. Thank you so much. Of course. You know, I, I loved watching that video introduction and seeing so many familiar friends like uh, Dr. Benali. I just wish we were all doing this together in Dubai rather than virtually. Um, the roadmap for this discussion will be to go from the more macro questions to economic to investments. Uh, we have a new prime minister in Japan. 
Um, somebody at the FT compared him to Lyndon Johnson, uh, president of the US after Kennedy was assassinated and then a one term and very controversial president. I want to start out by asking you first, Alicia, how much does it matter who is the prime minister in Japan? You could say that Abe was a very strong prime minister. He had strong beliefs. Yet even how much difference did somebody as strong as Abe really make? And does it matter who is prime minister today? Uh, that's a really interesting question. And I think the answer is that it's becoming increasingly important who the prime minister is. Um, I think it began with uh, Koizumi, who really started to take the ax to the old faction system, where it really was the faction who was running the country. Um, and uh, increasingly, and, and particularly under Abe, the influence of the bureaucrats has diminished. So we're talking about a rise of the cabinet office, the prime minister and the cabinet office being the leaders of the country, as opposed to the bureaucrats and faction system. I think the reason that Abe wasn't as successful as he might have been, in my humble opinion, um, was the commitment to revision of the constitution and those issues for which he clearly did not have the popular mandate, and yet it was really a fixation with him. Um, he did do he did start the ball rolling on several important initiatives, mostly the third arrow stuff, the structural reform. But clearly, his heart was not in it to the same degree, and uh, I think that. I, I disagree with the idea of, of Lyndon, of Suga as Lyndon Johnson. Um, I, I don't see that at all. I think that- No, uh, Suga as Lyndon Suga. Johnson. Did I, well, I you know, know, as the guy behind the scenes, the right. guy who pulls the strings kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. But I, 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 I don't think that Suga has his own agenda in the same way that LBJ did. Um, you know, Suga is very interested in the household issues. Uh, but he's, he, he's not the vision guy, not at all. He's an execution guy, if, if anything. But I think this um, deterioration of the absolute power of the factions and the bureaucracy is a very good thing. It's a very healthy thing for Japan. So, Jana, I'm going to turn to you. You know, as Alicia suggested, you know, that Prime Minister Abe's agenda was foremost a very nationalist agenda. And he never succeeded in achieving really substantial economic reforms. To what extent does it matter for the stock market who is the prime minister of Japan? Well, Henny, I'd, I'd start out by saying that I think one of the things that is happening in Japan is that there are so many changes happening sort of under the surface at the same time is that I think over the next decade or so is that Japan is going to be one of the big geopolitical surprises and economic surprises uh, on the planet. And I think that one of the reasons- Could you elaborate that, on that before you um, go on to explain the reasons behind it? Sure. I think Japan has been in a place uh, for a very long time where they felt somewhat protected and somewhat uh, uh, able to just do their own thing. And I think that now in a very wide macro sense with the Chinese breathing down their necks, the North Koreans having the ability to launch missiles over their head, the US becoming less reliable, that the Japanese are going to sort of pick up and make changes that they think are necessary to protect themselves and to secure their supply lines. And I, I mean that in the widest macro sense. And so uh, what you've done is that I think that those leadership positions that Alicia was talking about have become more important uh, than ever before. And I think, you know, we don't talk about it because it was so fast and so simple, but Japan just had a very peaceful transition, right, to new leadership. It's a big deal. And if anything, Suga is going to accelerate Abe's economic reforms, not slow them down. So I think that those things in, in aggregate are going to make for some very large changes in Japan to the market what it means is this consolidation that you mentioned when we started is gonna to continue to pick up pace. In fact, before everyone joined, I was talking with Alicia about it for a second. I think there were 10 TOBs announced last night in Tokyo alone. Um, so 
if COVID had slowed anything down, it only slowed it down for a few months because the pace of corporate activity, and I'm not talking about activists, I'm talking about Japanese corporate activity is picked up dramatically. Uh, and last night was just another, I, I mean, I can't even keep up with the amount of TOBs that were announced just last night. So um, I wanna pick up on something, a point that you made that I thought was so interesting. I mean, the US and Japan have long had this understanding, this quid pro quo, you know, we'll invest in your treasuries, you give us a defense umbrella. To the extent that Japan feels less safe, to the extent that the US under Trump has become a much less reliable ally, do you think that we will see Japan increase its defense spending in a big way? Well, you know, uh, flying again under the radar screen, people have failed to realize that I think Japan's defense spending has gone up every year uh, for almost the last decade. And so could the pace of that defense spending increase slightly? Sure. I don't think anybody would be surprised by that. I think, uh, and I'm a little less comfortable talking about this stuff than I am about corporate Japan, but I think many people fail to realize that Japan still has what is arguably the second largest Navy in the world. It may not be by ships, but by capabilities and uh, the means to deliver. Uh, Japan, I'd say, has arguably the second largest Navy in the world and knows how to use it. And there well, is... let me turn to you, Alicia, and, and ask you, I mean, I thought it was very interesting that Mitsubishi has abandoned its regional jet. How significant is that from your point of view? And what does it say about Japanese skills in a world where everything is dual use technology, both civilian and military? Um, yeah, I mean, Japan has struggled with the air, aircraft industry for, for a long time. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that that uh, abandonment of that plan means anything except maybe a reflection of what's going on at that particular company. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Japanese decision to walk away from the Aegis plan and everybody, uh, the, the U.S. technology and everyone scrambling around for an alternative suggests that there is capability. And, you know, I think your comment about or your, your label of dual use is the key thing. Uh, Japan is, 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 is still, you know, the uh, insides of the guts of every single high-tech device that we use. And in some of the services, John will talk about gaming, uh, you know, there is no, there's no indication that Japan has, fa has fallen behind in terms of that kind of technology. So l let's talk about COVID. To what extent do you think COVID will just be a passing thing, be it for a year or two years? Or has it been the catalyst for changes, you know, on a both macro and micro level both in the way the government allocates capital and the way the private sector does? Um, if you're asking me, because I, I yeah. just finished a, a webinar about this last night, I think where you will not see any changes, for better or for worse. Um, there were a lot of suggestions um, in America uh, from the Trump administration and also from Prime Minister Abe that companies should repatriate their supply lines. Right? And the Abe administration, in fact, announced this program of cheap funding for Japanese companies who- This is the 200 billion for right. companies that reshore. Right, that bring their production either back to Japan or relocate someplace in Southeast Asia. And there's basically been like two companies who've taken that off. I mean, I think this whole idea that COVID would force us to rethink the whole globalization of supply is obviously not going to happen. Um, the, the big change in Japan, and I will turn this over to, J to John because I know he has a lot of views about this, is about digitalization and empowering Japan to work from home and to get away from this ridiculous paper-based culture where everything is on paper. Every transaction requires a human being there to stamp his personal seal with a doc on a document. That will change. Uh, and it's interesting that similar to what's happened in New York, you are beginning to see uh, a, a mini exodus out of the center of the city, people moving out towards the suburbs or even 
increasingly to the rural areas. So that's a change. But I think the main thing that is not going to happen is the globalization of the world economy and of supply chains and of the flow of finance, as much as the national security laws that have been enacted in the United States and Japan have tried to accomplish that. So John, Penny. when we spoke yesterday, yeah. you, you talked about the prime minister setting up um, a digital agency, a cabinet level post. Um, and Alicia, when I was talking to you, you talked about how one of the priorities of SUGA is to reduce telecoms charges. I mean, is that really significant? Well, Henny, let me start out by saying, one, I think it's way too early to call exactly the changes uh, around the world that COVID is going to bring. I mean, I, it's certainly going Fair to point. bring some, and we don't know exactly where they are. I mean, one of the things I sort of smile about is I think that we'll, we'll probably never again enter a stadium or a large enclosed space where our temperature won't be taken as we're walking through uh, the entrances. I mean, they've been doing this in Singapore's airport uh, for I don't even remember how long. So, but I and think there's- And in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong. And I think things that will uh, definitely change is here we all are meeting in 30 some odd countries I heard when we started and we're all on an audio link instead of all having gotten on an airplane and flown. So do I think travel will come back? Sure, travel's gonna come back. But do I think that we'll do first, second, third meetings and other things by Zoom or whatever platform we choose to use? Yeah, I think this is gonna be a real thing. Uh, and I think that uh, travel will be lessened. Uh, it won't go away, but it certainly will be lessened for meetings uh, and maybe for some of these conferences and things that we do. So in terms of uh, COVID is also going to accelerate diversification. People talk about supply lines. People aren't yanking entire supply lines out of China or out of North America or any place else. What they're doing is looking at their supply lines and saying, gosh, if this part of the chain broke, went down, we'd have a real problem. So we need to increase the diversification of where we can produce and source uh, materials. And frankly, just to shift a little bit, this may have been one of the reasons that Berkshire bought into the five uh, trading companies in Japan is because they're seeing this giant shift uh, in what supply Let's lines get to like. Buffett right. a bit later. Well, let's talk about, you know, new economy, digital and in, in a broader way first. And, you know, how significant is new economy as opposed to old economy in Japan. I spent a lot of time in India and it's so exciting to see new billionaires in India on the back of renewable energy, for example. You know, yet, I, you know, I know that Japan recently committed to carbon free by 2050, but it was a source of dismay to many of us then in Madrid, the younger Koizumi, you know, argued that Japan still needed to be wedded to coal. So to me, I don't see as much change in Japan. I don't see, you know, as many people grasping the opportunities of technology in energy, just as one example. Am I wrong? I think, I think there may be something uh, to what you say in terms of energy. Uh, the problem for Japan is that there has never been, in my opinion, a concerted effort or a, an intelligent effort to make the population feel comfortable with nuclear again after Fukushima and after the tsunami. But uh, there's wind, there's solar, especially yeah, but, wind. Yeah, but I think there's no way that Japan gets um, directly from where it is now to renewable without going through some phase of restarting nuclear. And, um, and, and as you know, uh, the banks still continue to finance coal plants either in Vietnam or domestically. Yes. Um, I don't, and, you know, when they did open uh, solar to, when they opened the grid to solar, you know, the people who made money off that were Chinese, right? And in many ways, they kind of bungled that opening of, of the grid to solar. So yeah, Japan has, um, has a lot to catch up with in terms of energy, but in terms of the rest of this, of the economy, I mean, you see, uh, as John said, under the surface, you see by Japan standards, 
you know, and just an explosion of entrepreneurial activity, um, mainly by young people. And one of the things that gives me hope that this continues is that we're seeing a, le a record number of early retirements offered by traditional Japanese companies. And the age at which they're offering these early retirements continues to drop. So you've got people who are in the beginning or middle of their careers being given the choice you know, to opt out and start something on their own. I myself just became a, a director of a company which is founded by two guys who barely are 40 years old who gave up very promising careers in at McKinsey and places like that to start their own thing. And I- And what kind of things are they starting? So it's like a consulting advisory, a lot of stuff about uh, market research. Um, and you, you know, you go online and you'll find hundreds of these kinds of services being opened up. So yeah, maybe it's not, you know, the kind of energy tech that you're describing in India, but there's plenty of entrepreneurial activity happening in Tokyo. Yeah. John, to, uh, pick up on that point for me. And because that's so interesting, you know, many years ago, I was in Silicon Valley and I met somebody whose name card said that they were running Samsung of Korea's venture capital arm. And I said, when did you establish that? And he said, during the Asian financial crisis, now more than 20 years ago, Samsung was laying off so many engineers, Korea's fighting for its sovereign life. And they found that so many of their laid off engineers had begun really interesting startups. So they set up this fund to invest in the startups of their laid off engineers. And I thought, I would never see that in, in Japan. You yeah. don't see a Toshiba or a Hitachi or a Fujitsu, you know, seeing engineers pick up and begin things 20 years ago. John, is it very different today? Well, I think it, it's changing very quickly and I think it is going to be different. Uh, I think sometimes the greatest uh, impediment to more rapid increasing in technology and technology use in Japan is tradition. They have all of the talent and all of the skills and all of the money that is necessary to build new businesses. Uh, when you I say tradition, do you mean education basically? No, you know, a system that's all about memorization and hierarchy? No, I mean the tradition of uh, real innovation, of being able to be the nail that, that sticks out. Uh, I, I think Part of the problem with digitalization and the reason for pushing it is that there is this power in a hanko. There is this power in, in dealing with paper documents and that power has to be given up and it is a generational uh, kind of thing. And it's happening and it's gonna happen even faster I think than people expect it will. But when I say it's tradition that holds back uh, young Japanese from becoming the kind of entrepreneurs that we expect uh, in the US or in Europe, for example. And I think that's going to change. I think what Alicia is talking about is just the tip of the iceberg yeah, of younger you know, people stepping up to do very interesting things. Can I offer um, a piece of evidence, which is when the United States introduced the new overlay on CFIUS, the firma, which you know regulates yes. how much not only uh, money, foreign money, but people and stuff. You know, Silicon Valley organizations organized very quickly and fought back. They lost, but they fought. And in the same time, so too, when the Japanese equivalent was, was rolled out uh, this year, you also had a, the Japanese VC community fight back. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's big enough <laughs> to have found a voice to fight back. Hey, John, and Henny, I want to step examples? back. Examples? Examples of, of things that are, are changing. Interesting startups that you've come across, interesting entrepreneurs. And, you know, have they been educated at home? Have they been educated abroad? Henny, I'm going to stand that question a little bit on its, its head, is that right now it's not so much the innovation that you're looking at. You're looking at Japanese companies themselves changing the way that they do business. That's going to be the real A really impact. nice distinction and point. That's going to be the real impact, uh, both on the market and on the economy, is that the corporate balance sheets, just the public corporate balance sheets in Japan have almost five trillion. You mean listed dollars. companies? Listed companies, companies, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, the ones who are making those takeover bids uh, that I was talking about uh, earlier in greater and greater numbers. Those companies have nearly $5 trillion worth of cash on their balance sheet. And they carried it because it's a kind of a break. It's a different business model in the West where we use leverage. They have cash on the balance sheet. And yeah. I think both of those business models are going to converge. Leverage is going to come down in the U.S. and they're going to be more conservative business models, more stakeholder. Really? With zero interest rates? Yeah, I don't think zero interest rates actually mean very much. I mean, Japan has had zero interest rates for 30 years. Right. So I don't think it's it's had that much of an effect on the economy. Uh, so I think we can get used to engineering cash, but I think that cash is more and more going to go to work and the companies themselves, the traditional companies are gonna make investments in growth companies and they're going to put that cash to work and you're gonna have some very interesting things happening at the corporate level. I also wanna touch so on- So you think that a lot of these startups will end up being bought by the big traditional Japanese firms that are so cash rich? I, I think it's gonna be again, a little bit of a different business model. If you own 25 or 30% of a Japanese uh, company, you get to drag that growth and you get equity accounting. So you can drag that growth straight up to your top line. And you may not want to uh, influence the growth too much by pounding it again with that tradition of the larger company but you may very well fund the projects with your big pile of cash that are going on in these more entrepreneurial companies. And like I say, you don't have to own 100% of them. You can own 25 or 30% of them and drag that growth up to your top line. And I think that model is gonna happen over and over and over again in Japan in the next decade. That's certainly the way that Japanese companies manage their overseas subsidiaries and acquisitions, isn't it? They sort of let them get on with life and, and just continue to fund them. Yeah. So Alicia, can you give me any interesting examples of a big traditional company buying up a startup? And what about the banks? You know, I mean, before, when we all thought the ant IPO would happen, everyone was writing ant will be valued at approximately the same market cap of a JP Morgan, which is $320 billion. And I was thinking, you know, in five years, will a fintech company have a greater market cap than a traditional bank? How do you see this? And do these things work out when a company, and I'll, I'll want you to talk about banks because you know that sector so, so well. So that's an example. You have very traditional banks and you have a lot of really creative fintech startups in a country where the tr credit card charges of a JCC are what, like 5% for a merchant. So just take that one sector and talk us through the trends that you see. Yeah. Um, Whether it's banks reinventing themselves, you know, merging with fintechs to acquire technology they can't, you know, develop in house, or do you see fintechs? you know, saying, we don't need you. We're going to transform Japan without you. No, I think fintech is a, is a thing in Japan. It's always been a thing in Japan. Um, and I think the uh, one of the headwinds has been the reliance on paper in Hong Kong. But uh, with the prime minister addressing <laughs> that, you know, it'll make life easier. The banks, hey, look, Japanese banks are like any other regulated industry in the world. They have to be even more heavily regulated. And they are, if, if, if JP Morgan is too big to fail, you know, Japanese banks are too big basically to sneeze, right? And so um, <laughs> that's the p price you pay, right? So that they are heavily regulated. They have no capability of innovation whatsoever. I think, you know, some of the, non-life companies uh, who are smaller and perhaps less tightly regulated mm -hmm. are showing some signs of, if you look at the acquisitions, for example, that one of the, the, the top rated life non-life companies, property and casualty companies has made, you know, the uh, FinTech applications for housing and for homeowners insurance in America, for example, um, has been huge. I think those companies in Japan are seeding a lot of these FinTech things although not always in Japan. Um, so I, 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 I'm not so hopeful about the banks, uh, particularly the mega banks, because not only are they, these 
overly regulated, enormous, you know, sort of ships that you can't turn in the ocean, but they're also responsible for the rest of the industry as well, right? The, the, all of the other banks and financial institutions that lie underneath them. So I'm not going to be too critical of the Japanese banks. They are not innovating. But I think some of the other areas of the financial industry, whether it's the brokerages that are, you know, have seen online trading explode, um, who are making mm -hmm. um, acquisitions, the non-life companies, as I say, who continue to invest in startups, particularly overseas. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, I think just because the banks are, are Japanese banks doesn't mean that it's not help happening elsewhere. Henny, I want to take it in a little bit of a different direction again for a second too. Thank you. Symphony has you know like zero interest in the large companies in Japan because of exactly the kinds of things that Alicia was just talking about. The and you have to remember the four thousand listed companies in Japan or nearly four thousand listed companies only about 325 of them have a market cap that is greater than a billion dollars. So Symphony is interested in the other 85%. Um, that's where you're going to see a lot of these changes happen and, and not because the, the large banks or because Toshiba or Mitsubishi or anything is gonna lead the charge. The charge is gonna be led by those 10 uh, companies and some very smart investors whether it's in Berkshire Hathaway or in Grantham Bay or Otterloo out of Boston, some of the greatest long-term, most patient investors have just committed their first money to Japan. And I think they're looking at this as a very long-term play, and I don't think they're going to buy Toshiba or Mitsubishi. So what are the catalysts that will lead to further appreciation in the stock market? I mean, we've had zero interest rates forever. So, you know, the equity market should be the only game in town. But what do you see as the catalyst for even, you know, a very long-term slow upward grind as you voiced it to me last night? Yeah, because Japanese corporate management is changing where they used to only value the product or the employees or the development or management or the family shareholders are now being included in that discussion. And that means that you have to pay attention to what shareholders want. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be hostile or anything else. Management itself makes the change that, hey, we should also increase our shareholder value uh, because we're worth more than three times EBITDA. Uh, and so that is a huge change in the thinking of corporate management that says we should include shareholders as a part of this entire conversation. And that is the big difference. I think also the message is out there that like, look, GPIF owns three to 5% of nearly every listed company in Japan. And we need those share prices to go up. You guys need to get with this. It's a patriotic duty because we need the share prices that we own to go up so we can pay your pension. Those are the, the kinds of- Great point. Um, John, at the beginning, you wanted to differentiate Symphony from activist funds. So I'm going to ask you first, Alicia, you know, how much of a difference, how much of a catalyst is the work of activists, both foreign activists and um, local domestic ones? Yeah, I, um, I like to try to avoid using the word activist because underneath better than vulture yeah there's there's all kinds of styles there's all kinds of uh sizes and there's all kinds of uh strategies um i think what i would like to point out is that when we talk about japan being a hot hotbed of activism and by activism i mean people who generally have a small portfolio of companies who try to actively influence management either behind the scenes or by using the agm to felt float proposals um, Japan is a hotbed of activism in that sense, but only at the mid cap and small cap level. Uh, I think that most of the big companies, big activist funds, uh, like the one that I'm associated with, if you've got $40 billion uh, or $45 billion of money to put to work, you can't afford to screw around with these companies that John's describing. It just, you can't scale it. However, if you don't have that kind of uh, 
apparatus on your back. You don't have that kind of money. If you're more agile and you're smaller, um, you can go after these small companies who are just begging for it, essentially. They're so poorly run or they have so much potential to unlock their, their balance sheet. And so you've seen a flurry of activity in this market. I think the big companies like the ones we're talking about, the, the conglomerates, the old names, uh, sadly, uh, I don't think that they will be uh, the beneficiary of activist investment because they're just too well protected. Um, but so we have domestic activists who are, I think, increasingly more important and, and more influential. And you have one type, you know, at one extreme, there's the guy who sends a letter to his investee companies every month saying, I expect you to sell all of your cross share holdings by tomorrow, right? And then we have people like Symphony um, or others domestically who work behind the scenes in a more constructive dialogue. Misaki, the one, one of the ones that I'm associated with is, is more like that. So we have all kinds of different styles. And I think this is great that we have all different kinds of styles. Horses for courses means there's more horses on the racetrack for John to pick from. Yeah, hey, John, hey, can, without naming what, could you describe a situation where you had what uh, Alicia refers to as a constructive dialogue with management? Give well, us a we're not, we, we're not trying to fix companies. We're only investing in companies that already have excellent products, excellent management, uh, who are suddenly, or not even so suddenly, sometimes over the course of years, working those shareholders and the shareholder valuation into their thinking about how they manage the company. We're, as David and, and Shibata say in Japan, we're not interested in fixing the company. We're only interested in fixing the share price. And management has to be a board uh, for doing that. Uh, and as I said, we're only investing in excellent, uh, excellently managed companies that usually have a moat around their business. They have a 60, 70% market share uh, for a great uh, product that they may just either want to take themselves uh, private because it doesn't make sense for them to be listed, or they may want greater distribution channels. I mean, there's lots of different ways. Uh, many of them have not had IR departments, uh, institutional shareholder departments ever before. They haven't really made an effort to have a roadshow or to talk to shareholders or to tell people about, look at this great business. It's worth more than, as I said, three or four times EBITDA. So, I think that that is just going to continue to happen, and it's not it's not industry specific. It's management specific. Um, no. There is no sudden in industry that's just going to blow up because everyone's going to get the same idea at the same time. Uh, I do think that it's very management specific, and that if you have talked with and worked with management for a long time, that suddenly decides, hey, we want to get with this, and it might take us two or three or four years uh, to work this out. But those are the kinds of opportunities that Symphony is looking for. Yeah, if I can How give- would you assess, sorry, go on, Alicia, thank no, you. I have a specific example, which is not- uh, Please. Not disclosing anything, because a case study has been written about it, but one of the funds that I'm associated with, you know, found a Japanese company who was producing the world quality product that was totally wrong for Japan, which is baby stuff, right? <laughs> yes. And the guy at the time who was running the company didn't speak any language but J Japanese, had no women on the board, right? I mean, this was a kind of an easy fix. You know, you put somebody in there who knows how to run a global organization, who speaks more than one language, who brings in women on the board, and presto, it's not like we, it's not like there was a big fight or a hostile bid or a hostile proxy fight that had to take uh, over. I think this is kind of, without being, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I think this is kind of an example of the way that Symphony would operate. Am I wrong, John? No, I, I think that we're uh, one of our first uh, things when we're talking with the corporate management is do you have independent directors, truly independent directors? If not, why not? And you should probably add some because that will gain the attention. How would you know if a director is truly independent? This is an issue that comes up in China all the time. Well, and then it much, turns out that half the board are in-laws, you know, this kind it's, of It's thing. much easier in smaller companies than it is in very large companies, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, defining what is a truly independent director, let's, take, let's stick with large companies just for a second. If you're a semi-retired person and Toshiba's paying you $300,000 a year to attend board meetings, that's a great job. And so you're, you're 
ability to make difficult decisions is going to be influenced by the fact that you need that job. So like I say, it's much easier to do at smaller companies than it is at very large companies. And sure, it requires some research. It probably requires some legislation and jurisprudence about exactly what is an independent director. But I think every step that you take in that direction is good for the valuation of companies. So before we turn to Buffett, and I know you've been waiting for this moment, John, what are the risks that you worry about? What are the sectors that you would avoid in Japan today? Well, I certainly don't like any of the financials. I mean, this is really uh, any companies that have leverage or extremely difficult to figure out balance sheets. Any, any company that doesn't have a balance sheet that's so simple that we can explain what they do to someone who's not involved in the markets or to children. You know, they make something that gets sold to another company that it's a valuable piece of their product or something like that. It's not, uh, there's no bio, there's no pharma, there's no financials. Anything that is very difficult to figure out on their balance sheet uh, is problematic. I think that's why you see some of the uh, value companies. I noticed, I think Blackstone was involved in a deal uh, last night where they're looking at real estate. Real estate would be one of the first moves that a value investor would make uh, in Japan, although some of the real estate, I don't, don't get me started on some of the sports stadiums and things, but. Uh, but I mean, with by real estate, are they looking at new economy plays like warehouses or more traditional sectors? I think, I think more traditional at first. I mean, I think at least that's been what I have been able to see is that uh, uh, on the ground corporate Japan, and remember this is, we're talking about corporate Japan, not about foreigners, is that Corporate Japan is making moves to you know, temporary storage and changes in, in real estate and warehouses. Uh, you know, look, the example of WeWork is not lost on a lot of people uh, in Japan. And, and, and like I said, things are changing. Well, let, let's talk about WeWork for a minute. Do you expect that, you know, because WeWork had so many leases in Tokyo and was betting on so much growth Will we see some of Masayoshi Sun's portfolio companies default on their debt? Will we see, do you think his empire in Japan is built on more solid foundations than outside Japan? Well, it helps when you have as much money uh, as SoftBank does. Uh, you can absorb a lot of things that you might not be able to absorb otherwise. And you have lots Which of- Which is good news for Mizuho. Yeah, and you've got lots of deep uh, pocketed investors who may be willing uh, to make longer term plays to sort of support uh, the overall company. But, you know, SoftBank is an, an incredibly complex series. It's not just owning shares. So you wouldn't touch SoftBank? I don't think so. I mean, it's just... Alicia, you know, what's your feeling about Masayoshi Sun and well, SoftBank I, in yeah. Japan and outside Japan? Um, I, I can't talk about SoftBank because of the company that I work for, but I will say I was very interested. The um, Bank of Japan just released its biannual financial, um, what do they call it now, FSR, financial sector report. And there was data showing, uh, you know, the exposure, Japanese banks exposure to REITs and real estate. Uh, in which they had uh, a lot of data about uh, trends of real estate in Japan. And since COVID, rents uh, by retail and uh, hospitality have just dived right off the cliff like every place else in the world, but office rents still continue to tick up. And when I pressed on this- Fascinating. That, well, when I pressed on this, Henny, I think it will make sense to you intuitively that this massive long-term migration of Japanese companies from these really old 1960s, you know, non-intelligent kind of buildings into you know, newer, uh, more efficient office space is still happening. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, uh, as far as office space is concerned, perhaps it's not as gloomy as you might as assume. So Henny, let me give you a good example of, of something that uh, we're seeing that I think is gonna be a trend. You know, I told you yesterday when we talked that Japan is one of the only societies in the world that I know that will tear down a perfectly good building to put up a brand new one. So, and I, I think there's, there's lots of technological change that drives that. But let's talk about air purification systems. Um, 
and the kinds of things that are going to be built into the buildings that we're most likely going to occupy if central business districts do come back that are going to have lots of these safety valves built into them that don't uh, today i mean many of the buildings in midtown manhattan don't have windows that open so uh, i think that's probably going to change uh so i just think that there are lots of things to think about in real estate uh and changing real estate that have to do both with the period that we've just come through and guesses about the period that we're headed towards so okay um we have some questions from the audience which i thought would appear automatically on my chat and they haven't so i am going to turn to the questions now one of them is could um you all talk briefly about corporate governance in, in Japan. I, you know, I thought we had talked a lot about how corporate Japan is paying much more attention to shareholders. And, um, but if you wanna talk a bit about corporate governance and how far Japan has improved its corporate governance and how important is it you know, from the point of view of performance, do companies that have better corporate governance tend to do well? Alicia, I, I know you want to bite into that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I think that Japan deserves a lot of credit for the improvements it's made to corporate governance. And I think that they don't deserve half of it. <laughs> I mean, that there has been enormous change since the corporate governance code was um, in, in, initiated in 2015. So now the majority of Japanese companies have you know, two or maybe three independent directors on the board. And a lot of them have established all these committees um, and they are more open to having shareholder meetings. Um, but, uh, and so that's all good because it at least sets some uh, standards by which we can have a discussion with them. However, I think what most people don't appreciate is the legal status of corporate governance in Japan. So here in America, we have a system of three committees, right? Where you have the board of directors who is overseen by an audit committee, compensation, nomination committee. And these all have legal standard. They are independent and they are largely manned by 100% independent directors. In Japan, not only are they not manned by independent directors, but only 2% of Japanese companies do these committees have legal standing, which means that if the CEO doesn't like what his compensation committee is telling him, he just says, I'll handle it. And the reason that Japanese companies have resisted giving these committees legal standing is because as you know, Henny, uh, the Japanese CEO considered as his right, his privilege and the source of all his power to determine his own successor. And that is why uh, Japanese um, corporate governance has refused to sort of give these committees and the independent directors who sit on them the legal power uh, to do their jobs, essentially. The other thing that John has talked about and you've talked about is what is the independence of directors who sit on these boards? What are their qualifications? I've interviewed more than 50 independent directors in Japan and they turn, it's, it's generally binary. Either somebody's working really hard and it takes his job really responsible. I've talked to other independent directors who can barely tell me what their company does. So we're in the beginning of this journey, a word I hate. Um, and it's important that we set out all the milestones, but we're a far cry from getting you know, to where we need to be. Wonderful, hey. comprehensive answer. I'm, I'm gonna cut you off because we don't have that much time. And um, there are several really interesting questions. Um, and it's up to you both to decide who wants to take this one. What is your future outlook for Japan's overall drive to adopt blockchain as a revolutionary technology transforming industries? There is a digitalization drive and effort, but how far does it go? John, over to you. Yeah, look, it, it's interesting that we switched from uh, governance uh, to uh, digital currencies because it's actually the governance issues around digital currencies that is going to be the big fight that's going to come. And I think Japan is probably as well equipped as any uh, society uh, to handle that. Uh, governance around blockchain, how many votes it takes to actually certify a transaction right now is at 51 percent. And it's probably going to have to be more like 65 percent or better 
uh, for the governance of many of these currencies uh, to pass. And the central banks themselves are probably going to get involved because of the potential for destabilization. I mean, it's it's a wide open, it, it, it and you know, I hate to use the term, but in any industry that gets started and has the kind of fire behind it that digital currencies have had in the last decade, it's still a wild, wild west uh, for how things get uh, sorted out. So I think that it's interesting, like I said, that it's the governance of these digital currencies that are gonna matter. And I think Japan is as well equipped and as well qualified uh, to handle blockchain transactions as anybody on the planet. When somebody wants to know, and I think this is better for Alicia, what will China's role in Asia be and how will it influence Japan's evolution? Well, I think that's more a question for you, Henny, but I'll attempt. Um, I think my interest in this is um, I've been very involved, of course, looking very closely at the different national security regimes that have been initiated in the United States and Japan. And, you know, the whole Japan uh, regime is basically, it doesn't say this, but it's basically saying no China, right? You can't invest. Anybody who uh, has ever had a, is not regulated by people we respect, you can't invest here. That's going to be impossible for them to maintain, right? And, uh, you know, so I, 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 I think Japan clearly needs China. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very um, delicate and thin wire to walk both geopolitically, as John said, with the new administration here in the United States and Suga being somewhat less, somewhat more practical than Abe. Uh, and, and, you know, there is a fact, there, uh, there is a group in the LDP who's very pro-China. I mean, how much of the Japanese economy now depends on Chinese tourism? Um, so I, I, I think it's going to be interesting. It's, it's obviously going to be a, a, a new relationship. Uh, Korea is part of that as well. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch. It's going to be very, very, uh, I don't want to say dangerous. It's going to be very, very delicate. Uh, and I think, as you implied, Henny, that it's going to be more about China and Japan and the rest of the region finding each other, a, a place for each other, than it is about the United States. Thank you very much. John, over to you on uh, the trading companies. For me, my, by far my most important relations in Hong Kong with the Japanese community is with the trading companies. What was behind Buffett's very interesting investment in all of them? No, I, I, Henny, I know. And they're our... absolutely the opposite of what you say. They have super complicated. Well, as I, as I talked with you about yesterday, I, I don't think that this was necessarily, and I don't have any proof for this, I'm, I'm guessing, but I think this was probably the successors, Ahmed and Greg, making this investment uh, and not Warren. But why? Um, because I think that they are making the same sort of bet that Jeremy Grantham is making is that the period of this sort of unbridled growth of internet companies in the United States has become overvalued and that they are beginning to look for not only diversification in terms of currencies, but also diversification in terms of markets and growth versus value. Um, and so I think there are lots of things uh, going on there. There are the rationalists who say, look, he's got, you know, 75 basis point money that he can earn 4% on by buying into all of these companies. You and I talked yesterday about, I think they're buying a tremendous deal network around the globe, the global intelligence that you think that the Japanese aren't going to give up, but I don't think that's true. I know you and I disagree about that, but I think that it was a very long-term, long-looking, both diversification and deal flow uh, investment. Thank you. Uh, Alicia, you want to add to that? No, I, uh, I, I think I, I, I share your skepticism, Henny, that a training company is going to uh, be willing to share uh, a lot of its goodies with a foreign investor, even in Warren Buffett. Um, but I think it was, a, you know, it was great publicity for Japan. I'm rather surprised that more mm. hasn't been made of it. I don't, I don't understand why, you know, the cabinet office is in sort of, you know, creating Warren Buffett postage stamps or something. Uh, but they have, maybe they're- So we have one or two more questions from the audience. Um, who wants to take um, a question about um, information on Society 5.0? 
Does anyone, is anyone familiar with that? Really not. No. Okay, let's pass on. Um, somebody has a comment that since 2015, um, corporate governance is just window dressing. Um, somebody quickly wants to know, you know, how SUGA plans to reach the long, you know, not reached inflation target. You can say it won't if you want to. Alicia, that's for you. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you know, a number of, of, of observers and economists, mostly outside Japan, are throwing ideas ahead of him. But, uh, you know, Kuroda seems pretty determined to stay the course. And, um, yeah. I mean, to be fair, I think that corporate governance and stewardship was expected to be back in 2014 when all this started. The, the key to open the Pandora's box of energy and productivity and so on and so forth. And that hasn't been exploited. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not very confident, but I'm not confident of any other country, you know, reaching a two, three, four percent inflation target either. So we have a comment from the audience, which reminds me that one of the drawbacks of a virtual conference is that we can't really have a dialogue with the audience and tap on their expertise as much as I would like. So uh, one of members of the audience reminds us that Soros was investing in the Japanese railways for their hidden asset value well before the bull market of the 80s took off. Alicia, I first met you in Japan in the late 80s. Yeah, so there was another, there was an activist who took a, I don't wanna to say, take, took a run at a Japanese railroad company. Um, they've, they've made proposals this, this season and last year. And uh, the way that it ended, they were all defeated. They were very reasonable proposals. It was just, could you add some Japanese independent directors who have skill sets that you need? <laughs> um, and what happened? The, uh, all of the railroad companies got together and increased their cross shareholdings so that they could easily defeat the proposals. So that's the lesson. Yeah, Henny, I, I think the, as I've said a couple of times, the real magic of what is going to happen in Japan is because Japanese corporate managements are going to change because they want to, not because George Soros or another activist hedge fund or anybody else tells them what to do. As a matter of fact, that's yes. what Alicia just said, the drawbridges go up when Westerners come together and say, hey, we should think you should change the way that you run your business. So it's when Japanese corporate managements decide that they want things to change, that things are going to change. And my belief is that that is beginning to happen at, at an accelerated pace. On that happy note, let's end it. Thank you all so much for being such an engaged audience. And thank you, John and Alicia. Zach, I'll turn it over to you again. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, absolutely. would love to see you soon. Again, this has been a great virtual session. Thank you so much to everyone in the audience for submitting your Q&As. Uh, this was a, a very active dialogue, and it was great to have, uh, have so much engagement from, from our audience. Um, again, thank you so much to, uh, to all the speakers. I, I really enjoyed the panel. Um, we're going to be posting this also on YouTube for people to, to watch after the fact. There were a couple of people who messaged me on the chat and said that they missed certain portions. Um, so looking forward to posting this on our YouTube channel as well. Um, be sure to join us next week. Uh, we will be hosting another session uh, called Food Security, Farming in the Desert and Fishing on Land. This is going to be a very interesting session hosted by Abu Dhabi Catalyst Partners. We've made some very interesting investments in this space recently. So I'm looking forward to, to, to sharing the session with you then. Um, until then, uh, keep, keep following the AIM Summit platform. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you haven't already, sign up on our website so you can get the live sessions and be part of the Q&A. Thank you so much again for everyone uh, for having this great session. And thank you so much to Symphony. <laughs>